I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Back in 1980, I retired, and my wife and I moved to the Dales, Oregon. I was in a coffee shop one morning when I heard some guys talking about an Indian racetrack over in Washington, so I checked with the U.S. Forest Service and got directions. I went up there in late spring after the snow was gone, taking my White Eagle metal detector, a knapsack full of goodies, including some bottled water, extra batteries, and a camera. I was also carrying a canteen of water and a 22 caliber revolver. I went over through Carson, Washington to Forest Road NF6048. From there, I followed it to the trailhead parking spot. This is the southern part of the Indian Heaven Wilderness Area. The part that interested me the most was the fact that historic records say that every year this area was used as a gathering place for the Native American tribes of Yakima, Klickitat, and Columbia River tribes, and they would meet to gather huckleberries. Thousands of people would camp there each spring and summer. This annual rendezvous was quite well known, and it was reported that the tribes had had a horse racing competition. I heard that they placed bets on every race, and the racetrack had been worn several inches deep and straight as an arrow. One of the local old-timers told me that each tribe attending had side bets on the races, and huge bets of goods and horses were waged. I figured it would be a great place to metal detect, so I set out to see if I could find artifacts, as it held more excitement than coin hunting in the local parks. I followed the trail through the forests and over mountain meadows and hills for hours, and finally, I came into a beautiful area with two shallow mountain lakes, and in between them ran a long straight dirt trail that was the racetrack. It was about 10 feet wide and had to be about 2,000 feet long, at least. It was perfectly straight and without any grass or weeds in it. Well, I set my pack down, slung my metal detector off my shoulder, and started looking for any signs of old camps or anything showing where people had been. There were plenty of areas where there were clearings and evidence of where trees had been cut in the past. And in one meadow, there was a collapsed structure that must have been made by a white man because the rough timbers had old square nails sticking out, but it obviously had been fallen down for a lot of years. I did find an old jackknife, but it was not recognizable due to excessive rust, so I placed it back where it had fallen, as it seemed fitting, and it had to be from a white man anyway. The mosquitoes were horrible. Their stinging seemed more like needles as they attacked me without let-up. In order to explore an area deeper in a forest of pines, I had left my detector and knapsack along the racetrack at the northwest end and made my way through a particularly thick growth of balsams. I found a small pond where it seemed alive with frogs and tadpoles. It was filled by seepage from a slightly higher swamp which was full of cattails and grasses. I was probably about two blocks away from my pack, when I heard my metal detector chirp several times. But I didn't think much of it, because I assumed it may have slid on the grass. But suddenly it went off again, only as when it does when I'm swinging it over the ground as I'm searching. As I tore through the bush, I had thoughts that it might be another hiker. But upon getting back to the clearing, I found my detector laying by the trail and my pack was gone. I ran back to the racetrack so I could get a view of the larger meadow, and there was a creature. It was running fast down the racetrack, and its gait was hard to explain. Although it ran on two legs, it seemed more of a gallop, and it was slightly shaggy, like a camel with that scruffy loose fur hanging from it, like it was molting. I yelled stop, and it glanced back at me as it abruptly cut off the trail into the forest. I didn't bother to follow it, because I couldn't ride a bike downhill as fast as this thing was going. I did look at its footprints in the sand, and they were huge. I wear a size 10 hiking shoe, and when I placed my foot on its print, it was at least 6 inches over my shoe. Fortunately, my pack only contained snacks, water bottles, and, unfortunately, my camera. So I lost all except for my metal detector and the memory. When I told my friends about my experience, they asked me why I didn't shoot it. But, as big as it was, I'm glad I never even thought about it. It might have torn me to pieces. I don't think an animal that large could be stopped by a 22 caliber. Besides, I was out of state, and I was in its home. 
Even though I reported it to the forestry people at the time, I only got an oh wow out of them, and the paper in the Dales never printed anything. Thank you. My friends and I were staying at the resort cabins at one of my favorite fall fishing lakes in Jefferson County, Oregon. By the time we arrived, delayed by wiring problems on my boat trailer, it was around 3 a.m. We talked until there was little reason to go to bed, just to have to get right back up and catch the morning bite. About an hour and a half before sunrise, my friend Wes and I decided to go for a little walk down to one of the streams that feed out of the lake. I was curious to see what the fish were doing. We both had flashlights shining them into the stream as we walked along, trying to spot fish. The further we went, the more uneasy I became, and I've been in the woods all my life and I've never felt like this ever. I asked Wes if he felt weird. He said, kinda. We decided we'd head back. We moved to a different cabin closer to the lake. After the evening fish, I returned at late light, bummed out about missing a very large brown trout. I spent most of the evening listening to fish jump and looking at the stars. Wes's mum went to bed first, and about 11.45 p.m., the rest of us went to bed. My girlfriend and I were not sleeping in the cabin with Wes and his family. We were sleeping in the back of a full-size Chevy Suburban, mainly because we wanted a little privacy. We didn't go to sleep right away, and this was about an hour and a half after everyone said goodnight at the campfire. I sat up to smoke a cigarette, and I was looking out the rear side window when something caught my eye. The cabins where we were staying were not very large. There was an outdoor light attached to the middle of the roof line of the cabin. At first I thought it was the wind moving the tree branches or bushes, but something wasn't right. I then began to realize what I was seeing. I thought maybe I was a little more tired than I thought, and that my eyes were playing tricks on me. Except the trick didn't go away. Just to make sure, I asked Angela to sit up and look around and tell me what she saw. I didn't tell her what I was seeing or where I was seeing it. I looked down at the floor. I totally expected her to say she saw nothing. Angela sat up and wasn't even two seconds before she visually locked on to the same thing I did. Still looking at the floor, I asked, What do you see? Her first word was, Yeti. And with that, things now felt real. We both became excited, scared, and curious. I was a bit more uneasy with how the Bigfoot was moving and acting. It was about 50 feet away back in the tree line on the other side of the cabin, about 15 feet away from Wes's mum's truck. It was standing just out of the light so as to not be directly seen. It was about seven and a half to eight feet tall, covered in hair, very broad in the shoulders and across the chest. It wasn't as bulky as what was in the Patterson film, what made me very uneasy was its movements and actions. It wasn't coming forward. It had one arm up above its head and to the side, resting on a tree. It was rapidly rocking from side to side and bobbing up and down. Angela made a statement about getting out to maybe get closer to it. I was in the process of telling her no when the next surprise happened. Angela points out that there's more than one. About two feet behind the tailgate of my friend's mum's truck was crouched not one, but two of what appeared to be smaller Bigfoots. They were crouched closer together, sitting motionless and looking directly at us. They looked like they were younger ones compared to the big ones still rocking back and forth by the tree. They were not as broad in the shoulders or chest. Angela and I wondered what to do. Talking quietly to each other for five or ten minutes, I decided to wake up Wes by yelling toward the window of his bedroom, which was in the middle of the back wall of the cabin. Wes answered back, and I told him to look out his window. At first, he couldn't see anything through the window. I didn't tell him what to look for or what I was seeing for him of thinking we were pulling a joke and that we were totally out of our minds. As he opened the window, I asked him, Do you see it? His response was, Oh my effing God! Wes didn't say another word, which made me even more uneasy. I couldn't deal with it anymore. I jumped up to the front seat and was going to start up the rig to back them off a little. When I got up front, I couldn't find the keys. I became a bit panicky. I found the keys and started up the Chevy with a big vroom, and it hardly seemed to bother them. I then decided if I was going to see Bigfoot, 
then by God, I was going to try to get a good look. I was parked in such a way that I had to pull way out and swing the front end around for my lights to hit them directly. As soon as the Chevy moved, they took off back into the trees and bushes. I then headed down the road toward a picnic area where they might cross the road. On the way, Angela said she had had enough and didn't want to be around the Bigfoot anymore. I turned around, ended up taking a wrong turn, finding myself driving cross-country through the cabins and resort. I was turned around so badly I didn't know where I was. Angela spotted the cabin where we stayed the first night. I then began to drive out to the highway to leave because Angela didn't want to return until daylight. Just before I got to the highway, I remembered my friends at the cabin and the fact that they had their newborn baby with them. Angela agreed we couldn't leave them there, so we returned. Wes said that as we were driving off, something ran across the road behind us on two legs. Angela and I decided to leave the Chevy parked halfway blocking the road and go inside the cabin. After we got inside, I asked Wes if he had seen what I saw, because I still could not take in the fact that this really happened. Wes told me he definitely saw what he believes to be a Bigfoot. He explained that he became silent because of the two smaller ones at the back of his mom's truck. After 20 minutes had gone by, I needed a smoke real bad, and Wes's mom wanted something to drink. Both were in my rig. Wes was the first to step outside. On the way back to the cabin, we heard a bunch of commotion down toward the lake, like something running through bushes, snapping and breaking limbs. We ran to the front door of the cabin. Just as we started up the steps, I fell onto the porch, scaring Wes to death. Once inside, we talked and tried to rationalize everything that had happened. Things were quiet outside from then on, other than the fact that a raccoon thumped on our door, which startled us. What was strange was that the raccoon seemed to want to come into the cabin. The raccoon did not touch any of the food outside the cabin. I have lived on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation all of my life, and I've had three run-ins with Bigfoot. The first one was when my daughter was about two years old. We lived at my father's home at a place called Wolf Point. Back then, 1971, it was the only house out there, and the house had a large sliding glass door that went out to the back porch. Back then, the glass doors were only one pane, and we only had one thin white sheet to cover it at night. It was about 2.30 a.m. when I woke to hear my daughter giggling in the dining room. I walked down the dark hallway and came around the corner, and I was about to tell Diana that it was too late to be playing around when I saw why she was giggling. We'd forgotten to tack the corner of the sheet back up, so the sheet was only hanging by one tack, and the window was wide open with the back porch light on. On the porch, there was a small Bigfoot standing directly in front of the door, and it was jumping off the porch, and then it would jump back up, and my daughter would giggle and jump up and down. I could only stand there and watch, but I felt so scared, I wanted to just grab my baby and run. Then it saw me and jumped off the porch and disappeared from my view. That seemed to break me because I screamed, and she spun around and looked at me. And then I saw what I assumed to be the mother Bigfoot walk by the window. I lunged and grabbed my daughter's arm, picked her up, and ran back down the hall. My dad came out and asked what was going on. I told him. Being a very traditional Native American man, he got mad at me for allowing my daughter to play so late at night and told me to go back to bed. He said that Bigfoot have traveled and protected our people for many generations and they meant no harm to us if we leave well enough alone. The second time was when I was pregnant with my fifth child. Again, I was living out at Wolf Point at my dad's house, but he no longer lived there and had left his house to all his children after he remarried. I didn't see it this time, but our dogs were barking up a storm, and I remember my Mexican husband, not believing in Bigfoot, telling me that it was only the cattle or horses that wander around the area. Then the sounds intensified, and whatever it was was hitting the rain gutters outside. It wasn't trying to pull them down. It was as if it was trying to intimidate the dogs with its size or something. It intimidated me. And finally, my husband and my two younger brothers went hunting for rabbits in the Wolf Point area hills. They were all talking and not really doing a good job hunting when my husband looked up and saw, about a hundred yards away, 
a figure standing in the distance. It was an open range with only juniper trees. They had been on the plateau, and he assumed it was a horse standing facing them until it turned sideways and walked very fast away from them. My husband only described disbelief, being from Mexico and not really ever believing my stories. Then they all started chasing it. It went over a hill, and they continued running their fastest after it until they reached the point where it left their sight. He said he abruptly stopped because they were on a cliff that went straight down. He described them looking for a trail or a ledge that it must have gone down, but there was nothing. It just disappeared over the cliff. He has become a believer ever since. The thing that stood out to my husband the most was the speed that it walked, not ran. They were running full throttle and they were never able to catch up to it. Also, its ability to go over the cliff. As the story with my daughter, just the fact that it was playing with her until it saw me. There are many incidences here on the reservation, but there's a genuine respect for this creature, sort of like what my father told me. My mother shared that when she was a little girl back in the early 1900s, she had been with her mother near Hihi. They had been tanning deer hides all morning. She stopped tanning the hide and looked up on the hillside across the creek from where they were at, and there was one sitting on its haunches watching them. She was about to tell her mother what she saw when her mother talked very quietly to her. She told her to stop staring at it and get back to work. When they got back to their teepee, her mother explained that it had been watching them for some time and that it meant no harm to them. It was only waiting for them to leave so it could gather up the deer hair they left behind. The witness provided the following additional information. The witness mentioned that she herself, at the age of about two, would interact from inside their house with a Sasquatch on the outside in the same manner of her own daughter, to the consternation of her parents, though she herself could not remember the details told by her parents. When her small daughter effectively played with the small Sasquatch, the girl was somewhere near three feet, while the Sasquatch was about a foot taller. The witness used to have a pit bull, who was found one day dead with its back broken backwards, but no open wounds of any kind. One time, when some of her relatives were hunting, they observed a Sasquatch in the open country and pursued it in a pickup truck. On that occasion, the Sasquatch ran parallel to the road, looking at them, rather than veering off. The witness also mentioned that in the event of visitors coming to the Wolf Point residence, she would hear rock clacking nearby in the darkness. She mentioned that apparently a Sasquatch travels through the more developed area of the reservation to this day, and empties out garbage cans without tipping them over as bears or dogs do. The members of the Warm Springs Indian tribe openly acknowledge the existence of the Sasquatch, but do not like to talk about it very much. Thanks for listening. I think you might find this video of interest as well. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.